Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wills. Being put under house arrest in 2020 with all public protesting banned is certainly not what was on the ballot at the 2018 Victorian state election, but that is what the Andrews government has delivered unapologetically this year. Many who are rightfully outraged about how the Andrews government has conducted themselves throughout uh, both waves of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and uh, the big stick, big government, nanny state, police state approach. Uh, unfortunately, contrary to what some people have been calling for, there won't be a snap election. The Victorian governor won't sack uh, Dan, nor will there, will there be a federal military intervention to remove his government. Victoria has a fixed four-year parliamentary term, so the next state election will not take place until Saturday, the 26th of November, 2022. Given the year we've had, that seems like an eternity away. But if 2020 has taught voters anything, it's that elections have consequences far greater than the value many place on their vote every election. Despite the alarming curtailment of our freedoms and civil liberties in Victoria, at present democracy has not been suspended. Local government elections are taking place throughout Victoria via mail. In mail-in voting this October as we're scheduled. Uh, you will get your voting ballot in the mail at your enrolled address with each of the prospective candidates being featured in a brochure uh, where they vaguely outline their vision for the local council area. My biggest issue with local government, uh, the electoral system uh, we have here in Victoria is the lack of information, disclosure and transparency about uh, political affiliations of each of the candidates. A candidate biography might not reveal if they are a Labor, Green or Socialist Party member hell-bent on raising your rates, spending your rates on their pet social justice projects and infringing on your property rights. Local government elections also have consequences and in 2020 voters need to cast the most informed vote they have ever cast and need to make sure they do their own research on all the candidates on the ballot. Local government is the level of government that has uh, the least amount of scrutiny by the media, and so by extension, it's one of the, the least accountable. How does local gov government operate in Victoria, and how can you make sure that you cast an informed vote this October? Well, to answer that, uh, that question, and to, to, to help answer your questions, my guest tonight is a Liberal Councillor for the City of Greater Dandenong, uh, who is, oh, well, uh, by extension, running for re-election to the council, Timothy Dark. Welcome. Hello. How are you going? I'm oh doing as well as uh, one can be in lockdown Melbourne, which, well, as as I reminded uh, our our audience at the beginning, we're pretty much under another six weeks of it until at least October uh, 26. As I said, uh, it's basically lockdown 3.9. It is. It is definitely definitely. And uh, now you're uh, actually in the, the city of Greater Dandenong Council building a, uh, to appear on this, this show tonight. So you are still uh, allowed uh, to, to do uh, council constituent work uh, on the premises during stage four. So there, there's a couple of things that allow, particularly uh, as a council under the local government exceptions that are included uh, for constituent operations and things where uh, items are needed or to be able to have conversations with constituents uh, the council building is still there. Uh, Dandenong Council has put into place a significant amount of resources. So we've now got hand sanitizers, uh, checkpoints. It's mandatory to wear a mask when outside of the office. Uh, and I'm currently sitting inside my office. Uh, but the second I walk out to any of the common areas, it's masks on, uh, socially distanced and that sort of thing. Are you able to move just back to the center a bit? You're falling yep. off the screen. There you go. Thanks, excellent. Now, the way that uh, local government operates in Victoria is that well, every uh, local government area, whether they're a, a city, a, a shire uh, or, a, or a borough, has roughly around about 9 to 15 elected uh, local councillors. Sometimes they come from single wards, sometimes multi-member uh, wards, but uh, you're all part-timers. You all have your, your day jobs and the actual running of the council is left to a chief executive who uh, is 
appointed by the elected council and then there's a bunch of senior managers who assist with the the operation from it i've always had a problem with this type of operation of of local government because well as i just said you've you've all got your your your, your day jobs uh, you only get a, a get a part-time salary and you essentially have full-time bureaucrats running everything while you're you're juggling uh, your your day job and also uh, answering constituent calls uh, emails and and everything Correct, correct. So you basically, when you're elected a councillor, so uh, depending which municipality you're for, some currently have uh, multi-member wards and some have single councillor wards. Uh, there is a new local government act that the Daniel Andrews government was able to ran through parliament a short time ago, uh, and that has actually changed the area. So there's about 10 councils that now that are moving to single councillor wards. Uh, Daniel on council is one of those. And then in line for the next state election, uh, so the next council elections in 2024, uh, then it'll be moving to single council awards across the whole state, uh, unless they're in a regional centre, in which case they can, they can remain as one uh, unsubdivided ward, uh, or there's, if there's an exception that the minister can then grant. What is the, the reason for this? And uh, what's your uh, opinion on this? Because uh, uh, you're the, the sole Liberal on the, the, the Dandenong, uh, city of Greater Dandenong, City Council, there's nine Labor, one Liberal, which is you, and 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 one Green. But you are elected as part of a, a multi-member ward. So, obviously, in well, what still is a at the moment a safe Labor area, or would appear on the face of it, your re-election chances have taken a hit. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So uh, no matter where you go in the state, uh, no matter where, whether it's rural or metropolitan, generally there's always approximately 25 to 30 percent of the vote is a liberal vote. Uh, in every single booth that you see in a state and federal election, it's very much the same. So in a multi-member ward, the requirement you have is to get, say, three councillors from one ward, means that you'd have to get approximately uh, 26 percent to be able to get elected. Now, that's because that when you get to uh, the 78, 79 percent of the votes being counted, there's nobody else that can get elected. So a multi-member ward, in my opinion, always benefits the Liberal Party quite well. It benefits the Labor Party because it ensures you can get a Labor uh, candidate up as well. And then usually the third spot's open for the fight as to whoever preferences flow and how they go. Um, in a single council award, the requirement is you need to get 50 percent of the vote. Uh, 50 percent is a significant challenge particularly given that the area that I represent encompasses the suburbs of Noble Park and of Keysborough, uh, and that has a very strong Labor stronghold. Uh, on the, the state election booth analysis, if you compare that to uh, other areas, the state election of Keysborough, which belongs to Martin Pakula, uh, is one of the safest Labor seats in the state. Uh, it's stronger and more Labor than some of the suburbs and the electorates that are out west. So certainly uh, we're 38, 38 days before the closure and before votes start being counted on the 24th of October. Uh, but so I'm going to go as hard as I possibly can, uh, but it's going to be definitely a, a strong challenge. Uh, obviously, when the uh, first lockdown uh, began, uh, th there was uh, a push for uh, local council meetings to, to happen virtually. Uh, on Zoom, but uh, the legislation actually had to be changed to uh, allow that. Yep. Yeah, so the Local Government Act is an act of state parliament. Uh, the new Local Government Act, in my personal opinion, is very, very uh, pro-Labor and pro-ALP, uh, and that's been done in a couple of reasons, no doubt to consolidate the base that they've currently got, uh, and that's because the Labor Party, along with the Greens, have acknowledged that local government, one, is a very powerful organisation if they get the majority numbers on it, uh, and two, has significant sway and pull when it comes to being able to do certain things. Um, so that's become, I suppose, a key topic of where local government is heading at the moment. And what are the rules about campaigning at the moment? I mean, local government elections in the past, they have none of the feel of a state or federal election where there's signage uh, everywhere. It's it's always basically being been a, a ghost campaign. Uh, most people don't know who they who, who who's on the ballot until they get, as I said, that information pack, and it doesn't have party affiliation listed uh, on the on the ballot. 
And as I said in my introduction, it just has that blurb on it where most of the candidates have these vague motherhood statements that I want this uh, city or shire to be the best place to live, blah, 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 blah. And for all you know, they could be the, the most hard left uh, person on the ballot, but, but they, they might say th these nice and sweet things in their candidate blurb. Correct, correct. So you allowed a candidate statement under the uh, Local Government Act and the campaign guidelines that they've allowed. The current restrictions, which is being led by the new Minister for Local Government since the demise of Adam Symeric, uh, is the inability to be able to campaign, which has really uh, worked against any potential candidates running for council, and it is suited to benefit the incumbents. So what until last until Monday this week, before that, it was basically illegal to campaign. Uh, you weren't able to do any letterboxing. You weren't able to stick any signs up. Uh, you were really only constrained to what you could put out on social media. Now, uh, the city of Greater Dandenong is Australia's most multicultural municipality. We've got 160 different nationalities, and the majority of those aren't on social media. So a lot of them weren't aware of what was going on until they get information coming out from the Victorian Electoral Commission, or they get something from a candidate in their letterbox, which they've just allowed now. Now, the minister, under his directions from Monday this week, allows candidates to be able to letterbox for two hours a day during the prescribed two-hour exercise. Uh, and that's the only time that they're allowed to campaign uh, and put things in letterboxes. Uh, they're not allowed to door knock. They're not allowed overly to be able to get involved with and have any conversations with residents unless you're socially distanced and wearing masks. Uh, you also need to make sure you've got a little bottle of hand sanitizer, and that's actually in the minister's directions when you go out. So there's all sorts of guidelines they're putting in place. Um, with the second part of your question, you're definitely right. Uh, candidate statements that go out and post votes, most of the time, if they're ALP, they're written by the Labor Party. They're written by uh, members of the Labor Party, whether they be MPs, uh, affiliates of Trades Hall, uh, or people who are heavily linked. Uh, to give you an idea, the city of Kingston being next to us, next to the Greater Dandenong, which goes from Patterson Lakes all the way up to Clorinda, the Labor Party has appointed uh, Steve Michelson from Michelson Alexander to run his campaign. And he's running all of the ALP campaigns throughout the whole area. Uh, and you'd see a lot of the candidates running, they're using uh, information, they're using different colours, which can actually, uh, which is deliberately being done to misconstrue who a candidate really is. Uh, we had something very, very similar here in Greater Dandenong uh, in 2016 with my Greens colleague. Uh, he uh, is a member of the Greens, was previously a candidate for the Greens. And if you Googled him, you'd see that. Uh, but in his uh, campaign, he uh, acknowledged that the area that you would run was not going to elect a Green. And it, it's a very conservative area. Uh, and that was evident in a lot of the, the recent things we've seen. Uh, and he actually ran, I would say, almost as an independent liberal. And I've grabbed some stuff here and I'll hold it up to the camera to give you an idea. Uh, he, when, whilst he ran, you've got here uh, in blue writing uh, that he's the Greens, he's a liberal basically. Uh, it's blue, he's wearing a suit, uh, delivering for red gun. That has, that has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that he's a Green. Uh, and then the same thing with this one as well. Uh, you'll see that he's lobbying for things such as a community hub uh, for a high school, uh, advocating campaigns, and nowhere here at all does it say that he's a Green. Uh, and so people voted for him in good faith, thinking that he would represent their values. He seemed to be a conservative family man. Uh, and then he gets elected and he's uh, what would be arguably a hardcore Green. So th they're definitely, I would say to anybody who uh, is going into elections to definitely do some research on all of the candidates running. Uh, there's always going to be running mates and the Labor Party is, is the absolute best when it comes to that. They will deliberately run uh, three or four running mates with a lead candidate. And the lead candidate will be the one that has most of the paraphernalia being put into letterboxes. Uh, and usually a running mate will be somebody who will just have their name on the ballot paper and their job is to purely get four or 500 votes and to send those votes straight away to the lead candidate. Uh there's definitely a lot of room for uh, reform in the areas of transparency and disclosure of uh, party uh, affiliation, as you just said, with the, the current uh, Local uh, Government Act. It, uh, it seems to suit the, the Labour Party uh, fine. But obviously, with this local government election, uh, when well, we're, we're still under basically stage four lockdown, uh, government intrusion into uh, our lives has occurred like nothing else before. And given the fact that the, the lockdowns has thrown many uh, out of work and 
obviously with uh, not much to, to do, they've got the, the perfect opportunity to, to do their own research, become uh, informed. There's, there, there, I'm not sure if you're aware of uh, public choice uh, theory, economics, uh, their, uh, their theory of uh, the rationally ignorant voter because they're so busy living their, their lives that they're, they're not bothered to be informed by, by politics. But given that, well, a lot of people have lost their jobs because of uh, the federal and state government policies, particularly this uh, second shutdown here uh, in, in Melbourne, the, the, the state government, they, they certainly, it, it, it is rational for them to be informed this election. Yeah, definitely. I think this is going to be a very, very interesting election uh, on a couple of different fronts. One being that a lot of people at the moment are home. Uh, it is a postal election. So people, I think, will have time to be able to get on Facebook, get, have a look, get on Google, search for some candidates, see what they can do and make sure that the person best represents their values. Uh, in 2016, when I ran for council, it was an attendance vote. I was not a postal election. And a lot of the people who turned up at the polling vote, uh, to polling booth on election day, were people who actually had no idea who they were voting for. They just knew that they didn't come and vote, they're going to get a fine, and they turned up and said, I'll make my decision when I turn up and I'll go from there. And that's a really interesting part to see because a lot of people uh, are not totally accustomed to the role and the power that local government has. Uh, I consider local government to be an excellent uh, training school, if you will, for people who are interested in politics, interested in governance, because as you said before, it doesn't attract a significant amount of media coverage. Uh, you're still able to maintain a personal life, do whatever you want in your daytime during your main career. Uh, and then at night time, you're able to uh, attend functions, represent your community uh, and to advocate for policies which you fiercely believe are the best things for your municipality. Um, I was, and when I ran in 2016 and was successfully elected, and I'm the first Liberal ever elected to the city of Greater Dandenong in its 25 year history. Uh, it, it was a shock for, I think, a lot of the Labor colleagues. The councillor that I succeeded was a local high school teacher who had been on the council for 17 years. Uh, he had a significant amount of a profile. But these days, people want somebody who's going to fight for their values. They want somebody who's going to be energetic, who's actually going to get out and about, who's going to make sure that the community are represented, and they're going to make sure that there's not this big waste uh, load that goes on within local government going to keep occurring. I'm not sure if you've come across or, or actually met uh, local Southeast Melbourne community activist uh, Simon Johnson in his uh, Southeast uh, Community Forum. Uh, there's a lot of posts about uh, who is running for, for local government elections, uh, w uh, where their political affiliations actually lie, and as you just said, the, the, the fake uh, blue uh, candidates, whether the, the, they be wearing blue shirts or having blue uh, election uh, materials, but uh, obviously given the, the, the current uh, political animosity towards the Andrews government, uh, I doubt there, there's going to be much local election campaign material in red. Nobody's going to be using red whatsoever. Uh, and you're correct, absolutely correct. Uh, a lot of the Kingston candidates who are actively campaigning at the moment. Uh, there's one running in the Karawana ward, which covers, I believe, Dingley Village. Uh, and if you have a look at that, everything is dark blue. It's a liberal blue. Uh, his photos are with suits. Everything that you would see, you would see that he's a liberal running for Dingley Village, which historically carries a, a, a large liberal vote. Uh, and he's a member of the ALP. His campaign's being run by Steve Michelson from Michelson Alexander. Uh, and when he gets, if he does happen to get elected, uh, then he will be required under the party constitution to follow the ALP policies that they allow. Uh, you certainly are right that there's a lot of duds and a lot of the ones who are members of the Labor Party have refused Labor Party endorsement, which is interesting. Uh, now, my opinion, why the reason why is because if they're identified as a Labor candidate, the ALP is not very popular at the moment. Uh, I think they're worried about that. And you also see that I know the mayor of the city of Kingston, who's a card cutting member of the Labor Party and are very, very active in ALP politics. She's using a yellow color palette for everything. Uh, her partner, who's also a councillor in the city of Kingston, is using a liberal blue and he's wearing a blue shirt and uh, I think a jeans or pants in his photo. And they've erected a big billboard where on one side she's wearing yellow, he's wearing blue on the other side. And to any other innocent bystander, anybody looking, we think that they're non-political, uh, they're members of the community, not knowing that they're hardcore members of the Labor Party. 
Well, for those who know the, the, the color codes of political philosophy, obviously blue is associated with uh, conservatism. Yellow, uh, in my view, is associated with uh, libertarianism. And obviously, there, there's nothing uh, libertarian in the Victorian Labor Party at the moment. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, and that, that, that's what we're currently up against. You see, uh, the Labor Party is very tuned to local government. They've been in the space for a very long time. Uh, they dominate the organisations that are there to support local government with the uh, VLGA, the Victorian Local Governance Association, and the MAV being the Municipal Association of Victoria. Uh, both of those organisations carry a significant pull uh, across government policy. Uh, they oversee and represent all local governments. Uh, which runs into the billions of dollars worth of money collected a year, uh, billions of dollars worth of infrastructure, uh, and it's dominated by the Labor Party. So the unfortunate side is that I think a lot of uh, people had sort of thought that uh, look, local government had a space and potentially had gotten quite big and there's been a lot of cost shifting, no question. Uh, but I think what, where we're at a point now where it's going to be critical to get more conservatives and liberals elected to local government to ensure that they can then represent the values of the community they're going to serve. Uh, you and I, we would be too young to remember uh, Victoria's council amalgamation under Jeff Kennett, uh, Liberal Premier, in, in 1994, where the, the amount of councils was significantly uh, reduced. I don't know the, well, I haven't got it in front of me, the, the exact uh, figure, but it was basically every three council roughly became one council and obviously we've seen in in new south wales and queensland council uh, amalgamations are extremely unpopular you yourself obviously being a a local councillor and knowing uh, the the workings of uh, uh governance what's your opinion on whether local government areas should be small or big look i think that uh, and when I was young and I was involved in uh, student politics, I'm pretty sure that somebody will find that there's no minutes where I supported uh, local government being kept back to the basics. Uh, over time, local government has been the shifting ground for both state and federal governments, both Liberal and Labor. Uh, they've both shifted incredible amount of resources onto local government. Uh, in my opinion, local government is the closest to the people. Uh, it represents a smaller portion uh, and it has a significant amount of budgetary requirements, which we have. Uh, previously, to give you an idea, the city of Greater Dandenong comprised of the city of Springvale, the city of Dandenong, and then some other parts of other municipalities as well. And then with the Kennett merger, it became the city of Greater Dandenong. Uh, centred in, in Dandenong, we still have significant facilities in Springvale. But to give you an idea, once the amalgamation went through, there was invariably a double up of resources. What we have now is uh, a budget that's about $170 million a year, uh, and then we have complete control over that as councillors. We can direct funds towards certain projects in the capital improvement space, uh, certain social social policy projects, uh, advocating for things as well. Uh, it's become quite a powerhouse. And a lot of people have had the, the saying that local governments are relevant, should stick back to roads, rates and rubbish, or it should be abolished, and we should just revert back to state and federal. Um, I'm probably more of, the, more of the opinion these days, I think it's probably worthwhile more having more liberals involved in local government. Uh, in my opinion, local government's not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. It's only gonna become bigger uh, and it's only going to grow as the governments shift more and more services away from the federal and state governments and cough shift more onto uh, local government authorities. So I think that at the moment, it's definitely a space where we have a lot of potential to get more conservatives, more liberals onto the council. It's across the whole state. It's just a matter of getting them up. Well, as things currently stand, the reason why local government is unpopular is they're only in the news when they do something ludicrous and particularly those uh, inner city uh, councils in Melbourne such as Yarra, Moreland and, and Darbin with their, their uh, anti-Australia Day uh, motions which uh, the, the, the federal government uh, given that uh, they are the ones that authorize citizenship ceremonies has basically said look you either celebrate Australia Day or you can't conduct citizenship ceremonies and obviously when a, a lot of people on the right see that they just see well this is what you get with 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 local government all of these uh, 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 local uh, greenies and, and socialists and uh, labor people taking it over to to utilize for their pet causes and obviously australia's national day is not something a local Council uh, should decide. I remember, was it years back now in New South Wales, the former Marrickville 
Council decided to endorse their boycott, divestment, sanctions on Israel. What's that got to do with a council in inner Sydney? Correct, correct. So, so look, the, there's certainly in the inner city, you know, Darabin, uh, Yarra, uh, you name it, there's certainly some Greens councillors. And the reason why the Greens councillors are there, uh, in line with what we've got at the moment, we've got Socialist Alliance running, Socialist Alternative, the uh, Victorian Socialists. There, there's all these groups running in those Yarra inner city areas. Uh, and they run because it's an area that they know they can poll somewhat quite well. It may be a breeding ground for them to then look at moving into different politics. And you're right, they do take uh, very strong political positions in terms of uh, voting against Australia Day, voting to cancel the Australia Day services. And local governments are the ones who conduct the citizenship ceremonies on behalf of the uh, community, on behalf of the federal government. So we receive a, a letter from uh, the Minister for, for, for uh, Border Protection, which is Peter Dutton, uh, and we then basically conduct the citizenship ceremonies on his behalf uh, under delegation. Now, those inner city Greens ones, they move their motion, got a lot of media coverage. Uh, in Greater Dandenong, I lodged a notice of motion almost at the same time, saying that Greater Dandenong reaffirms our position to celebrate Australia Day on the 26th of January. Uh, and that was covered and carried by the majority of my colleagues, with the exception of my Greens colleague, uh, invariably because of his beliefs uh, and his political alignment. But it certainly shows where... Uh, candidates a lie, and also it gives you the provision to be able to reassert positions uh, and conservative positions on local governments as well. Going back to, as I described, the, the, the system of local government we have in, in Victoria, it's described as the council manager system where there's an elected council, but they appoint a, a manager and other senior managers to, to run the, the daily operations. That's in contrast with what's called the, the strong mayor council system, which is what cities in the, most cities in the United States have. For example, the, the mayor of uh, New York is full-time and obviously city authorities in the US, they run a lot, a lot more, including the local uh, police department. But if you want a, a local equivalent equivalent of what I term a stronger mayor council system, you look at uh, Queensland's, uh, when they amalgamated their local councils in 2007, uh, just before the, the, the pandemic shutdowns were complete, they had local government elections and there is much more disclosure in Queensland about who's affiliated with what uh, party. A, a Brisbane uh, City Council, it's well known that the LNP has a majority and th there's a much more visible media scrutiny of it and obviously uh, that allowed back in uh, 20 uh, 2011, Campbell Newman to make the leap from Lord Mayor of Brisbane to Premier uh, of Queensland. So what Queensland has, it seems to, well, those sort of uh, reforms that they they had, which was actually introduced by the, the Beatty government, uh, they have allowed much more transparency and by extension scrutiny of local government in that state. Yeah, definitely. Look, the, the Mayor with every municipality is a full-time position. Uh, councillors receive about 30000 per annum. That's a council allowance before tax, and then you pay tax on that. Uh, the mayor of every municipality receives a salary, uh, looking in the ballpark, around 100000 per year. Uh, on top of that, they also have an office, uh, an executive assistant in the car. And that's across every municipality across Melbourne that I'm aware of has got the same sort of thing. Uh, the Lord Mayor in the city of Melbourne operates on a slightly different structure, that being that businesses have more votes than residents that live there. Uh, and their system is sort of skewed differently as well. Um, look, I think that local government ha is an excellent way to be able to, if you call it, say, training training wheels, to learn how things operate, learn how governance operates and get things going. Uh, the most critical part to the successful operation of a council is the CEO. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you have a crap CEO, you're in real trouble uh, because they ultimately are the ones who do the hiring and firing. Uh, the Local Government Act prohibits councillors from being able to uh, intervene in any staffing matters and it carries significant penalties for that. Uh, so it's important that when you do have, when you are in the council, that you do have a CEO who you know knows all their staff. Uh, Greater Dan, you know, is very, very fortunate with our CEO. Uh, we were, before I was on council, he was actually poached from the city of Manningham. Uh, he's served on the executives of LG Pro. He's an engineer by trade. Uh, he knows everything in the ins and outs. So he knows how to run a council, knows how councils operate, knows where you can run the operations from it. 
where then you get some of the councils like uh, the inner city ones in the city of Yarra, Darabin, those sort of inner city ones. They don't always appoint somebody based upon the best merit, uh, as long as you suit certain criteria for them, whether it could potentially be uh, the gender, could potentially be uh, beliefs, uh, your position, wh what, whatever it is. Uh, and often that's where a lot of these local governments is important to get involved because the next thing you know, they're heading down the path of uh, almost pure socialism in a local government perspective and they're using council's rate phase money to do that. I think it's good that more and more local councils are now moving to live streaming uh, council meetings directly to uh, Facebook and, and other social media. That's something I think that uh, the Victorian uh, Houses of Parliament uh, should do, legislative assembly and council uh, should do that. That's been an excellent uh, development. Obviously, when uh, council meetings were allowed to take place uh, in person, there there is a, a public uh, gallery there. Uh, what's your, uh, obviously uh, there's been a lot of talk uh, with the, all the politicians still meeting federally in Canberra and in Victoria obviously meeting centrally on, 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 on Spring, Spring Street that there should be allowances for more virtual uh, democracy because, well, another thing that uh, MPs uh, get into trouble for is uh, their, their travel allowance and if there's some sort of and i'm going to use one of those awful new normal words uh hub if there's some sort of say hub chamber where at federal parliament victorian mps could go to participate in federal parliament votes could still take place and with the uh victorian uh parliament as well because we've seen that uh, the uh, st uh, uh, state parliamentary committees have been able to conduct well on on Zoom. What do you think about uh, the idea of, I don't want to use the term new normal, but uh, having more virtual uh, democracy to well, cut cut down on, on some of the uh, expenditure and also increase the transparency as well so people can tune in on Facebook and YouTube to watch council meetings or other proceedings? Yeah, so Greater Dandenong, we have our uh, meetings broadcast live. At the moment, they're broadcast live online. Uh, we are working towards the integrated platform to broadcast on Facebook. Uh, unfortunately, those systems are quite expensive, but we are actively working through that at the moment. Uh, and that's because a lot of people don't, a lot of people underestimate the power that local government has. They underestimate the actual works and projects that local government has. And I agree that look, transparency is always good. Uh, now, in local government, the way that the local government act is worded, uh, you cannot be out of pocket for any of your council incurred expenses. Uh, I personally don't claim any kilometric to travel from home to the council building for a council meeting or travel to any of these real functions nearby um, and sell them to the majority of my colleagues. A couple do. Uh, and look, that's because of the way people sort of look at the options. Some people will take it as a gravy train and will maximise as much as they possibly can get out of it. And that can, can include domestic trips or interstate for conferences and things. Um, I, e.g. my Greens colleague, I know he went to Byron Bay for a climate change conference, I believe, uh, and that was all in the rate pay of Greater Dandenong. I think the rate payers are really unaware of a lot of the things that go on with local government. And if they were aware, I think it would then shine a light on what has happened in local government, what is happening in local government, and I think it would get people more involved to be more active as well. Let's turn to uh, some of the uh, politics and, and demographics in the, the city uh, of Greater Dandenong. And uh, Dandenong was in the news at uh, the end of, of August uh, when there was an, a, a series of nights of anti-lockdown uh, revolts uh, amongst uh, Albanian, uh, I think there was some Turkish uh, Muslims who decided they would all go out for their hour uh, exercise at the same time. Uh, Victoria Police didn't like this, uh, one of the uh, instigators, as uh, th they would term them, uh, was, ch I think, charged with uh, incitement. Incitement, yep. Uh, yeah, and uh, we, we saw broadcast on the news that uh, capsicum spray uh, uh, was used, and it was quite something to uh, behold because, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, City of Greater Dandenong, one of the most uh, multiculturally uh, diverse, and Labor has long thought uh, that they had the uh, the multicultural ethnic vote uh, in the uh, in in the bag. Uh, but uh, we, 
even though those uh, nightly confrontations have now ended, uh, I follow uh, a lot of these uh, local Dandenong Muslims on Facebook and they are still have red hot anger about the, the continuing lockdown. The, uh, a lot of them do have their, their own uh, independent media. They, uh, uh, they're always raging against uh, uh, dictator Dan as a uh, local councillor and one who's not uh, bound to Labor Party policy. What's the, 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 the feedback that you've got? Yeah, definitely. So Greater Dandenong is Australia's most multicultural municipality. Uh, there's over 160 nationalities, uh, over 200 different dialects being spoken. Uh, and we are one of uh, arguably the Australia's most uh, conservative electorates uh, in the whole country. Uh, the city of Greater Dandenong in the uh, uh, same-sex marriage vote overwhelmingly voted no, one of the only two places in the whole state that did that. Um, and generally, you're very much correct that, that it is a very safe labour area for the community. What has happened is the, the Albanian community are, are very, very active and they're very savvy when it comes to creating businesses. Uh, they want to get in. A lot of them migrated from uh, previously a communist state. Uh, they got in and they migrated to Australia. They set up their life. They went into business. Uh, they worked very, very, very hard to build where they've got now. Uh, the lockdowns that came into place really reasserted to a lot of the multicultural community that it was almost a return of communism coming back. Uh, and it was creeping back by having curfews, by not being able to leave your house, by having to go out and having to mandate to, to wear a mask, to wear uh, all sorts of things to make sure that you didn't get it. And a lot of the residents were, were, were giving a bit of pushback towards that. Uh, their businesses have been shut down by the mandatory closures. And so what happened was uh, a couple of residents started to get active. One got particularly active on social media uh, and said, look, can you believe this is what's actually happening? Uh, and the other ones were sort of saying, well, I'm in a point where I want to be able to still go out. We're, we're being curfewed down at one hour of exercise a day, and we might as well quietly head out and protest, I suppose, in line with following all the guidelines and protest peacefully. Uh, so I, when I went up one of the walks and I was there walking along and there was a lot of younger families, there was the grandparents walking around with the younger generation, and everyone was, was very, very happy. Uh, there was incident that occurred where the police created a blockade in the middle of the street uh, and tensions flared up there. Uh, and I, as I made several comments to the media outlets, look, I think that it was an overreaction on behalf of Victoria Police to then significantly boost resources. There was something in it, the city of 50 to 100 police cars. There was over a couple of hundred police members. They've seen horses. They've had uh, the big divvy vans. They've had the public order response crews. You've had the riot crews, you name it. And they've turned out to sort of give pushback to a non-event. Uh, in my opinion, if they were able to walk through the streets, they would have gone out and done their walk for the one hour. They were all socially distanced. The majority of them were wearing their masks. They were following all the rules and guidelines. And all of a sudden, there's 200 plus police there to, to basically monitor them. Uh, and I think that was a big catalyst to the issues that did occur. Uh, but a lot of information has come back to me over, over the last particularly few months from a lot of the multicultural communities, uh, whether they be from the Slavic region, being Bosnians, Serbians, uh, Croatians, uh, across to the Indians, uh, Pacific Islanders. A lot of them are really, really up in arms. Uh, they've seen that their, their businesses where they work have shut down. They're sitting at home. They're not able to leave. The only time they ever leave is to go get groceries. Uh, and even then, some have said to me that, that that during a minor bit of a panic that the shelves can easily get cleared out. And then it's going to start to get a lot of people worried about where things are heading, uh, particularly of recent times. Ones that have got younger children who are supposed to be in education and they're having to learn from home via Zoom or via Microsoft Teams. And kids are starting to have issues learning and remembering things because they're being uh, stuck and not actually getting out of the house. So I think that there's, the Labor Party has taken uh, for granted a lot of the multicultural community in, in Victoria for quite some time. And I don't know whether they really will hold on to them at the moment. Uh, certainly, you're right, the state election's two years away. You never know where things are going to go. But uh, certainly, they're still very, very, very upset. Uh, as we saw earlier this year with the uh, 60 Minutes expose on former local government minister Adam Somniak about the, the branch stacking uh, that he was uh, organising, uh, he, uh, well, he's still an MLC for South East Metro, but uh, an independent now. I noticed that he's, he's starting to, to post some uh, cryptic tweets uh, again, yep. which, is, which is quite interesting. But those recordings basically revealed how they... Labor would use these or well, ethnic communities to, well, it was all about shoring up the, the votes and using a lot of these ethnic communities to shore up, well, not just votes at election time, but also 
uh, pre-selections as well. So has that sort of had a, that expose had a, had a, has it hit some of the communities that wow, we were a bit used? Oh, I think, it, I think it has. I think there, there, there no doubt, uh, and Adam Sumrak from, in my belief, certainly acted as much as he possibly could. Uh, I think his battle was particularly with the fact that the Labor Party was being hijacked by the Greens. Uh, he's a conservative Turkish uh, guy by, by then, I believe by belief as well, he's very conservative. Uh, so I think that was something that also sparked it because Marlene Caruso, who was also involved in that branch stacking scandal, was also conservative. Um, and I think that they saw that the Labor Party was being hijacked by the Greens. Uh, certainly, multicultural groups play a significant portion. Uh, if you can sign them up, and as you've seen out west, the Labor Party's done a very good job with a lot of the Indian diaspora out there, and they had hundreds of members who joined the Labor Party, and they would turn out to vote at an AGM, and they would turn out to vote, and they would cast votes in the several hundreds, and that would be all for specific positions on the executive. Uh, and that, that's where I think things sort of get to the point where uh, politics inevitably is a numbers game, and I think a lot of the multicultural community who really did bank on them last time uh, would definitely reconsider if the election was tomorrow, who they'd be voting for. And we saw uh, a week after uh, local Muslims in Broadmeadows also uh, revolt uh, against the, the lockdown. I think that they were Lebanese Muslims from uh, memory, but it, uh, it, that's another very safe uh, Labour area. A local Labour MP is uh, Frank Maguire, uh, Eddie Maguire's uh, uh, younger brother. Uh, certainly the, uh, the lockdown enforcement has been uh, particularly uh, more, more stringently uh, applied in la uh, safe labour areas. And we should always remember that well, it was in the, the, the smack bang middle of a safe labour uh, in a Melbourne where they well, locked down those public housing towers, basically a stage five Wuhan lockdown. They weren't allowed to leave their, their, their flats at all. Uh, that was, we, we still need to remember that was an extraordinary uh, uh, imposition, you wouldn't say imposition, but uh, denial of human rights. Well, absolutely. And you're right in terms of the broad meadows, in terms of Dandenong, where the biggest outbreaks of people who are getting upset are, are people who are in the safest Labor seats. Uh, now, whether that's because they feel they've been neglected by their member of parliament uh, or their values no longer really align with those of the Labor Party, it's becoming a very interesting time ahead. Uh, the Labor Party previously uh, with John Brumby when he was a premier and before that did have some relatively conservative sort of approaches. Steve Brax was had some conservative tendencies as well. Uh, and that was something that led to uh, a lot of people still supporting him. Daniel Andrews sits on the socialist left. Uh, his radical social agenda is something to be believed out of, out of you people just get shocked when you talk about it. Uh, I think that's been a big catalyst for people who are starting to wake up and see what is actually going on. Um, people are becoming aware that if they don't start to be pushed back and become aware of what is going on, that potentially, you know, we're, we're seeing so radical social policy in schools, that kids are then being radicalized with certain views, uh, and that just runs contrary to their beliefs that they've had for a very, very long time. And uh, the Muslim community is very, very socially conservative, very socially conservative. Uh, they're ones that I would say almost on belief value should align with conservative right-wing parties more than the left. Uh, and I think that's where over the new generation coming through who are between uh, 18 to 30 are starting to see this, starting to say, well, hold on, you no longer represent my views. So I think we'd, we definitely have a lot of work to be done there. Well, you and I, uh, we're, we're, we're old enough. Well, we, we grew up with the, the, the Brax Brumby Labor government, which uh, considering what we have now, it was pretty much a cannot light uh, government, a modern social uh, democrat style of government, similar to how Tony Blair uh, ran the, the United Kingdom when he was he was prime minister. The uh, uh, government was still largely uh, out out of your life, uh, just focused on making sure that uh, major events uh, were occurring in Melbourne. There was the successful Commonwealth Games. Uh, we got the was the East Link uh, built. There was also Peninsula Link built, and the the Geelong. Uh, bypass just steady, stable government, and look at what the the modern Labor uh, government under Daniel Andrews is delivering in in in, in twenty twenty. And 
when he announces a, a new package or, or, or something, that is money that we don't have that's going to have to be paid back. Uh, Brax and Brumby were pretty fiscally responsible. They were. They were definitely uh, very, very fiscally responsible. They, uh, whilst at the end of the day, they're still a Labor government and they still delivered some deficits as well during the time, uh, they did push very, very hard to make sure that they spent on projects they could afford. Uh, Daniel Andrews, in my opinion, has taken a crash and burn approach. He's spent up big, he's borrowed big for a very, very big spending agenda, such as the uh, suburban loop, where there's supposed to be a, a tunnel train line from Cheltenham all the way around all of the CBD, all the way out to the western suburbs. Uh, and those sort of things are very, very, very expensive. Uh, the unions have got very big control over the cost of these big projects and they blow out because the wages are very, very high. They get significant return uh, and that costs the state government a lot. Uh, Daniel Andrews has borrowed a lot of money and I think now he's getting to the point where he's having to figure, try and figure out where he gets his money from next. Uh, I think he had banked a lot on the, the Wheaton Belt Road Initiative and the partnership that he signed with China. Uh, and I think since the federal government announced they're reviewing it, that potentially could be a loss of a significant funding source for the infrastructure that Daniel Andrews wanted to deliver. Uh, that and with the shutdown, the loss of tax revenue coming into the state government must be significant. Now, as you said, you received a lot of feedback uh, from your uh, constituents, ratepayers, uh, when uh, the Victoria Police crackdown happened in, in Dandenong. I assume that well, Labor councillors and the, the local uh, Labor MPs officers, Martin Pakula in, in Dandenong and it's Gabriella Williams in, in Dandenong, yep. they, they would have re been receiving uh, calls and, and emails, a lot of them probably uh, very uh, abusive and, and threatening, uh, but we have seen all, all the, the, the Labor MPs and uh, by extension ministers just follow the the Andrews uh, strategy, the the Dan plan, uh, they all obviously in the in the Labor Party. If you cross the floor, uh, you get you get expelled. That's not the case in the the Liberal uh, and National Party. Surely, the it is having an impact. Well, at least on the the staffers in the, those offices, the the feedback that they're uh, they're getting, uh, then uh, they don't seem to be acknowledging any of it. But surely that would be having. Uh, behind closed doors, a uh, serious impact. Look, you, you think it would, and I think it's it's interesting to see how the amount in which they, they are admitting that they are being inundated with calls and emails, and certainly with the legislation to extend the emergency bill, there was an inundation of, you'd see all the independent MPs were getting bombarded. Um, I think the issue ultimately comes down to the way in which the Labor Party structured, as you touched on before, that the MPs are bound to follow ALP policy. Uh, if this was a Liberal Party that was in government, I could almost guarantee you'd have a, almost a backbench revolt of a stack of MPs trying to force uh, rolling leadership and that sort of thing. Uh, the Labor Party, it, it, they're all basically in line. They're all towing the same party line. Uh, it was mentioned to me that uh, with the Adam Somyuk branch stacking affair, that the Victorian Division of the Labor Party being dissolved, and those matters are now basically being run out of the Federal Secretariat. And the Federal Secretariat is controlled by the Socialist Left and Anthony Albanese. Uh, and if they wanted to maintain their pre-selection, then that was something that they had to follow the line. The issue that I think has certainly become in politics, in state politics over the recent years, uh, is we're having a lot of people that are becoming careerist politicians uh, who want to get in, they want to spend their whole career being a member of parliament. Uh, they don't deliver significant uh, agenda that they've set out to do. They just want to basically sit in the seat, collect the salary uh, and relax. And I think that's something that, and they don't also then from there don't want to lose their seat because they lose the seat, they lose their job and they don't want to do that. So that's why we see a lot of uh, leadership tensions, people trying to swap uh, leaders out during party room challenges and things. I think that's why the Labor Party changed their constitution to make it harder for Labor MPs to try and roll the Premier or the leader of the opposition to protect them. Um, does that, uh, I know that the Federal Labor Party has that now rule, but does the uh, Victorian... Uh, Labor caucus have that rule as well? I believe they do. I believe they do. Unfortunately, I'm not a member of the Labor Party, so I wouldn't know the internal, full internal workings. But my understanding is that uh, there requires a significant majority of the Labor MPs to sign the re to then have a call at party room meeting to spill the leadership. So I think that's why I think he's, he's doing a phenomenal job at causing uh, a lot of issues for the sitting MPs who must look at their internal polling of their seats and have sleepless nights. Um, but I think he's in a position where he wields significant power and they're arguably too scared saying, well, even if I speak out, if I lose my endorsement, then I've got nothing left. 
Are you refer to uh, Daniel Andrews then? Yeah, look, I think that I think so. I think so. I think a lot of MPs are aware if they speak out against Daniel Andrews, they speak out against the government policy. They say it's crazy, as you said. They they're going to get sanctioned. They can lose their membership of the ALP, uh, or if they could then potentially face a challenge. Uh, and the way that the Labor Party is structured, whilst the members have a vote, the unions still carry considerable power, and that needs to be endorsed by the state executive to give you your position as an MP. Uh, and I really don't think that that's a case of something happening. And Dictator Dan, it's not just a, a, a nickname. Uh, it basically the the whole government is run by by him and his office. And as we saw uh, during the the coronavirus response, the the cabinet was shrunk to that uh, gang of eight. But it doesn't seem. Well, we see Daniel Andrews every day. We occasionally see uh, Jenny McCarkos, uh, Tim Pallas, uh, Martin Bakula. Uh, James Molino, but despite uh, the uh, concern about uh, Victoria Police's enforcement of the lockdown rules, we haven't seen Lisa Neville for ages. No, well, look, that, that, I think it's the Labor Party and the way that they run their operations is incredibly orchestrated. Uh, everything that you see uh, has been well planned out, well thought out by people who work in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, that may be the ministerial advisors. Uh, so you, you're seldom going to get actually what you want from them. That's why every time Daniel Andrews fronts a press conference, he fronts a press conference, he wears something different. And he wears something different, whether it be a suit or whether it be a jacket, the North Face, to accommodate to whether it's a weekend or midweek. Now, that's something that, without question, has been something that's been advised to him, and he's then implementing that. Uh, and the same thing with Lisa Neville, with Jenny McCarkos. The reason why they're not fronting the media, in my opinion, is because they've got, there's a lot of questions to be answered, and they don't want to answer those questions. And if you don't appear, then you don't have to answer the questions. And, oh, well, uh, I know that we, we, you talk about the, the North Face uh, uh, jacket, which has uh, become somewhat of a, a, a cultural uh, icon now. I remember uh, because yeah, social media is a lit uh, at, the, at, the, at the moment with uh, uh, Dan Andrews' uh, stuff that if the, the press conference is later in the day and he's wearing a suit on a weekend, then you know that he's going to announce something bad. Yep. yep. Correct, correct. And that, that's all been orchestrated out. Uh, it all provides subliminal messaging. It sets a tone. It sets a precedence. People then know what they're going to expect. Uh, and that, that is how this sort of thing rolls down because people then go, okay, this is what we're going to do. Let's go from there. Uh, and then they will plan every single move out. Uh, very much like the President of the United States, every single move is planned out. What they're going to say is planned out. And that is done and orchestrated to a T. And he has 64 staffers in his Department of Premier, which is 13 more than the Prime Minister, uh, uh, Scott Morrison, who has 51. Yep, correct, correct. And those advisors have all got their set role. They've got their responsibilities and their job is to provide information or, or ideas or thoughts uh, and then basically to be carried on onto the MP. So whether it be Daniel Andrews and his, out of his, all of his advisors, the one that will advise on social policy, one that will advise on financial policy, policy, one that will advise on different things, and then ones that he'll do in his inner circle, no doubt, who say, you should do this, you should do that, you should wear this, and go from there. Now, the Victorian Liberal Party has been described for many years as, as mediocre, and based on the, the 2018 uh, state election performance, it was uh, nearly a wipeout uh, with the, the swing against the uh, Liberals uh, and National, and uh, basically it came down to that they just weren't visible they weren't uh, weren't, weren't well, uh, they just didn't have many strong performers they weren't getting a message message out uh, but they appear uh, as dan andrews has well, nearly done everything wrong uh, during both the first and second wave that uh, a victorian parliamentary liberal party has finally awakened from its slumber and it seemed to be triggered uh, back in May by a, a tweet from uh, Tim Smith, who's the shadow planning minister, who, because Dan Andrews, uh, when he uh, relaxed the, the first lockdown, where you're allowed to have five visitors at your home, but uh, pubs, clubs and restaurants couldn't open because in his opinion, uh, it wasn't viable for them to open with 10 patrons, even though Daniel Andrews has never run a small business, but he as we've shown, as he's demonstrated, he is the decider 
uh, based on his opinion, it's uh, decided. Uh, Tim Smith called him a friendless loser and who'd, who'd want to have a drink uh, with Lurch and uh, with the hashtag Dan has no friends. And I remember that caused a, a frenzy at the time. In my opinion, it was a, a Trump-like uh, tweet. And I remember when uh, Tim Smith on, on Mother's Day init initially went off at, uh, at Daniel Andrews, he was uh, slapped down by the opposition leader, Michael O'Brien. Uh, but after that, uh, that tweet from, from Tim, uh, Michael O'Brien decided, no, that's actually a, a good idea to, to go, go hard against uh, Dan. And it's Michael O'Brien has, has really uh, come into uh, his element at, uh, I, I see him constantly on the, on the news and, uh, 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 very, uh, and very present on, on social media, getting the, the message out there, putting an alternative plan out there. And it seems that, well, the, basically the, the Dan show unraveling uh, that it's finally put a firecracker up uh, up the Victorian Liberal Party, and they're out. Finally, they got some fire in them now and taking a stand. Yeah, correct. Look, I think that the um, Daniel Andrews in the last election, he ran a very big campaign when it came to infrastructure, uh, and that was something a lot of people saw. Uh, and he ran a very good campaign. And the and with the loss of that, we lost a lot of good quality MPs, a lot of conservatives as well. Uh, and with the loss of that, we lost a lot of voice. Uh, because the resources having less MPs means you're really limited to what you can do. And I think the Liberal Party uh, suffered a bit of shock given how big the swing was against the Liberal Party. Um, and uh, for quite some time, they went a bit quiet and sort of took a step back and did a bit of reassessment. And I think that since this uh, whole debacle started uh, and the pandemic's been running through every the community and things, so the Liberal Party certainly is now starting to realise and wake up and say, okay, this is how we need to set the strategy and this is what we need to do. And this is how we can actually start to get back into, into the game. Because historically, the Liberal Party does very well in federal government, and we've dominated the federal government for a very long time. But when it comes to state governments, forever and a day, uh, we always seem to have a, a weakness there. Uh, it seems to be something whether we, I'm not sure whether we don't put enough resources in or whether we don't target the area correctly, um, but we seem to fall behind. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it's something that over the last 25 years, we've spent four or six or something in, a, in government. Now, that's pretty poor. Uh, I think it's the new generation as well, of MPs who are becoming, uh, who are joining the Liberal Party, becoming members of Parliament, getting involved, uh, have a different approach. They've gone to the days where we're having a very conservative sort of approach, where we uh, arm and are and think about things concisely. Now I think we're re re returning fire to the Labor Party, who themselves play very, very dirty. Um, you know, they would they would hammer and hammer and hammer the same thing time and time and time again, uh, making accusations which weren't thoroughly correct, but it was enough to carry the weight. So I think what we will definitely see over the next couple of years and hopefully led it to the next election is the ramping up of holding the Labor Party to account, uh, really pushing hard to make sure that the, the people are being represented, people's voices are being heard. Uh, and then hopefully then we, you will experience a swing back to the Liberal Party and reclaim a few more seats. Because during the, the Bellew Napthine uh, one term of government from 2010 to 2014, most of the, the cabinet and ministry was leftovers from the, the Kennett years and obviously that was a, a good government that that was a good government but when you have these aging uh faces it's it's basic it there's there, there's no renewal and obviously to be turfed out after one term in 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 2014 and need to find the uh next generation that's particularly difficult you you don't just need a good fresh young candidates, but you also uh, need fiery ones as well. And obviously, uh, 2014 was before the, the, the Trump uh, age, where he showed that you can be this uh, bombastic, uh, out, uh, outspoken, maverick person and still win. And obviously, with, with Tim Smith's uh, tweet, which I call it basically the, the trigger point, uh, ba it has finally sort of brought the Victorian Liberal Party out of this uh, safe uh, approach. And uh, I remember back in well, uh, 2014, uh, this was when the uh, young aspiring politicians were, uh, were getting caught out saying non-politically correct stuff on, on social media. One of the, the 2014 Victorian Liberal candidates, Aaron Lane, had to 
uh, quit uh, because he, he used the term faggots twice on, on Twitter. And even they tried to cut down your uh, political career based on some Facebook screenshots, uh, wi uh, which you posted in a Facebook group uh, where you... Uh, <laughs> criticized uh, butchy lesbians and didn't like uh, body hair uh, on women, which obviously it's a banterish uh, Facebook uh, discussion. But this, th th this type of, oh, you know, we can't have this sort of colorful language uh, and that we must have the most bland and boring people uh, possible. This is part of why the Liberal Party became irrelevant. And obviously that, or oh, basically BS scandal, it didn't hinder your political aspirations, you got elected as a councillor in 2016. Look, the, yeah, look, the, I think it's been very interesting times. Uh, I joined the Liberal Party in 2011, the start of 2011. Uh, I was not very political in high school. Uh, I was actually wanted to become a chef and I left high school and sort of pursued that and dropped out and politics was something that came later down the track. Um, and I think the new generation, what we're seeing is uh, quite a different story to the previous generations. Uh, in the older generations, they would go down to the pub, there'd be pub chat in the afternoon, everyone would go on to work, and then between four and six before they went home for dinner, the uh, people would go down to the pub, they'd chit chat, and then have commentary. Uh, the new generation are the first generation that use social media. Now, across all political parties, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party, the Greens, every single party has been tripped up by candidates, by MPs who have made comments in the past on social media. Uh, and being the first generation of people who use social media, uh, I don't think anybody quite realised what potentially what comments you would make and how they would come back potentially to haunt you down the track. Um, now, in 2014, I made some comments. Those comments were screenshotted as part of an internal uh, dispute within the Labor Party and were then sent to the Age, um, courtesy of the opposing faction. And, and from there, look, there, there was an Age article in the lead up to the state election. Uh, it was not a very good article. Uh, and it was done and it did cause a lot of damage to people's personal lives as well. Uh, I know that there's been some really good people who I was in uni politics with who would have become excellent people uh, in business, excellent people chasing political futures. Uh, and they would make comments that would then be screenshot and sent to the media outlets. And it would cause some significant damage, not only to their careers, but also to their personal lives. Uh, the stress that that puts on you, seeing that uh, an article is published with your name and pictures and and those sort of things, it can cause a lot of damage. And that was the way that uh, certainly some political groups play. They play very, very dirty. Uh, I think it's something that uh, certainly I was not the first. Uh, I will certainly not be the last. And there's going to be a lot more people that we will see over the next few elections that come into play where they've commented on something, on another photo, in an internal post, on another post somewhere else that somebody digs up and they play dirty with and they use it against somebody. Uh, we saw it with uh, a candidate who ran for the Labor Party in Melbourne. He made comments... Uh, I think 12 years ago, before the last state election, so it'd be 16 years ago, where he had queried something and all of a sudden there was big pressure to have him disendorsed by both parties and it all went down south and basically destroyed this guy's career and his life. Um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, a time where I was young and I was stupid and that sort of thing and then I was able to understand exactly how things work, uh, to get back involved and to not then let that succumb to what your past is, not your future. And to then get back involved, say, well, I'm going to represent my community and to go from there. And at no point will I ever stop. Um, by default, I'm a conservative and I'll always argue for conservative values. And I'm not a person that's going to step back and then say, okay, yep, we'll just backtrack that because it's the wrong thing to say. Um, and I think that we will definitely see, as I said, over future generations over the next few election cycles, that there'll be more and more candidates that will get tripped up. And it's it's a term of because the, the media... They, they learnt to love these uh, gotcha social media mo uh, moments. But obviously, as an observer and a reporter myself of politics, these things blow over if you, if you just don't uh, panic. And obviously, as, as I mentioned, you came through it easily. You got elected uh, as a councillor. Uh, the... Uh, the other person that I mentioned, uh, Aaron Lane, he's still very active uh, in Liberal Party, he's still got a bright future ahead of him, uh, which, which, which is great. And I just, I, don't, I haven't asked for your opinion on it. Uh, uh, Tim Smith's initial tweets, uh, which, and basically Michael O'Brien in the end, not, uh, not, not sort of slapping him down, that was, you consider that basically a positive 
development for this sort of more fiery strategy? Look, I think it's worthwhile seeing where these sort of things go. The only way you can know whether they're successful is to see how the return is. Um, in my personal opinion, I can't stand Twitter. I think it's the shittiest thing on earth. Uh, Twitter is full of lefties and you just go there just to war. You never really win. Uh, people argue and, and you cannot really make any common sense approach on Twitter without being slammed by lefties across mm. the world. Um, and so I've generally stayed well, relatively clear away from Twitter. Uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how that carries through. And I think the key area for the Liberal Party to form government to win back is to target the communities who have been hit the hardest. So really, where the Liberal Party, in my opinion, has really dropped the ball is with the multicultural communities. Um, multicultural communities, as I said previously, uh, by default, they're socially conservative. They want to come. They want to just earn, quietly start their own businesses, earn their money, raise their family, live in peace and harmony. They don't want to be, they have their kids susceptible and exposed to the radical safe schools, respectful relationships agenda that being forced upon their kids. Uh, they just want to live harmoniously. And I think that's a, an area where the Liberal Party really hasn't quite targeted very well. It's an area that they sort of have just sort of let go whilst they chase marginal seats. They chase the electorates of uh, Morty Alec, of Karam, and they chase uh, key little projects to try and win votes versus actually going back to the core beliefs of people and saying, well, we represent the majority. Uh, and the Labor Party, I think, has tried to do that to some extent, not very well, uh, but there's definitely scope to be able to properly do that. Uh, the other thing is, that, as I said before, the Parliamentary Liberal Party, uh, a lot of MPs have been there for a very, very, very long time. The Australian Institute of Company Directors says that the maximum time you should ever serve as a director of a company uh, or involved as a leader of an organisation is between eight to 12 years. Now, that would be uh, four terms being four years each. Uh, so three terms, sorry, being four years each, four at 12. Um, and that would then allow them to get in, do whatever policies they need to, try and deliver whatever they can, and then time to move on to your next venture. And I think that's a, a key part versus being there for 25 years and then actually no longer representing the constituents that are there. And that uh, becomes a bit of a concern for the new generation who uh, of the millennials who like us, who want jobs, we want secure jobs, we want, to, we want affordable housing, we want to be able to live uh, harmoniously, uh, we want to be able to ensure that we have everything that we possibly need. And things that we believe in, things we want, particularly freedom of the press, uh, you'd be able, to be able to use social media, like at the moment, you can't even make a Facebook post without potentially having Victoria Police come bang down your door and charge you with incitement. Those sort of things carry very, very deep to the millennial generation. And I think it's something that it needs to be really pushed to show that this is actually what represents us. Uh, going back to, to Twitter, uh, I think uh, the, the Labor Party and uh, by extension, Andrews, they're, they've fallen for the, the fallacy that Twitter is real life because the I stand with Dan hashtag, it was there for so long during the initial of the, the, the second wave. Uh, but I've noticed as, uh, uh, as a user of both Facebook and Twitter, the, the anti Dan, the, the, the dictator Dan, which oh, I should, I should mention was actually first uh, coined by uh, liberal MLC, Bernie Finn, who also calls him uh, Despot Dan. I know that uh, Tim Smith has settled on on Chairman Dan, but the, the I stand with Dan Colt is, is crumbling and they're becoming more and more uh, uh, basic, uh, exposing their, their cult-like tendencies and they will just defend every action statement that Dan Andrews makes, believe uh, his dishonest and misleading statements about hotel quarantine or what, uh, who, who came up with a curfew so much where uh, these were the same people three months ago who were demanding Victoria Police be defunded and now they're supporting Victoria Police, well, the incitement charges and uh, the riot squad uh, shutting down these, these anti-lockdown uh, protesters and Obviously, this culminate uh, the this sort of uh, I stand with Dan cult culminated with uh, a Victoria Police vehicle uh, hitting a, a mentally ill man, and then the his uh, head being being uh, being stomped on. I noticed I stand with Dan Cold as thinking that he was a, a COVID yet anti lockdown protester and was saying, "Yeah, Victoria Police, they 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 did a good job there." That's how unhinged and cult-like they became when, no, this had nothing to do with lockdown. He wasn't a COVID idiot. He was suffering a bipolar episode. And this, uh, this pandemic has just exposed just how 
uh, detach from uh, any sort of objectivity uh, his his supporters are and by extension just uh, uh, reinforces that uh, and Andrews and uh, his people they've they've just got this narrow focus and they don't listen to anything else yeah look oh, I completely agree look the the Twitter verse if that's what it's called uh certainly is um something that is controlled by the left the left has dominated it since almost its inception uh you can try and have a tweet debate you can tweet off back and forth and wage a bit of a war but ultimately they're never going to swap what they believe in and it's a pointless exercise because you never one you're never going to try and sway them they're always going uh, to i know that i'm just pointing out that just the absurd mental gymnastics yeah. they've got to correct correct and i think that they, they've these people have followed suit time and time again there's never going to change their stripes but now they're getting stuck because now they're realizing that the, that everything that they've always been pushing for that i believe in dan is actually not all that they believe in when you see the instances that have been occurring where you can no longer make a facebook post without victoria police coming in kicking in your door as we saw in that guy in ballarat and the woman who was uh pregnant being handcuffed with six or seven police in the house uh people then sort of look at that and actually go hold on a second what is going on here how come you're arresting a pregnant woman in her pajamas for making a facebook post uh and i think that's when the left get really really confused where they're actually ideologically stand. they will die in a ditch before they they dump dan and it's always i'd love dan 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 but when it goes the other way and it actually contradicts their values they start to get very agile they get very agitated and they go oh, i don't really want to talk about this or they'll try and redirect it to something else uh and i think you're right that, that they have based a lot of their policies around what they're seeing on the tw on the twitter sphere versus actually what is going on on the ground uh we have the greens candidate for uh the keysborough south ward which is not a ward, a ward near me uh and she's running for that area there and she sent out a tweet that uh, said um that called the albanian muslims in daniel and said that they're white supremacists uh now that was in screenshot and there was a whole lot of uh, comments about that and they were saying well hold on we're actually not white supremacists we're migrants from albania for starters oh but uh, they were proud of being australian they during their war they were playing the correct. australian anthem with australian uh flags so they therefore don't become uh, 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 they're, they're not muslims for that period of time and they the automatically their skin becomes whiter that's how it works absolutely absolutely and no matter what it is the media will work to twist it the age is most prolific and the daily mail is probably not too far behind and they will deliberately write things and then skew it in a way that makes something completely irrelevant to what was actually going on. Uh, the same way that you saw the age saying, oh, you know, these riots in Dandenong, you're out of control, there's, there's this and that, there's capsicum spray being going, there's full riots going on. You go down there and there's maybe 10 people yelling, 20, 30, 40 people who are yelling after one person gets slammed to the ground. Hardly a riot. Uh, but the media sensationalizes and the age has done a very good job at sensationalizing that sort of thing. Uh, and I think that you're right that the Twitter sphere these days, People will send tweets out. It spreads very, very quickly. Uh, and these days, there's a whole lot of information flying around. It's very hard to prove which is correct. And as I mentioned, with well, the uh, the scrutiny increasing on uh, Victoria Police, and I mentioned that uh, abhorrent footage of that mentally ill man getting uh, hit and and stomped on, uh, that we're seeing the Victorian community lose confidence and actually be scared of the Victoria police now. And we've seen well, heaps of, of videos now of uh, uh, people being questioned well, for not wearing masks correctly. There was another pregnant woman who was told that she couldn't sit down on a park bench uh, while she was out uh, exercising. And obviously we want to avoid what's happening in the United States with uh, the uh, uh, debate and 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 also what's happening on the on the, on the streets with the uh, uh, the the police. We want a both a we, we want a strong and fair uh, police force. And it's very concerning when you you see uh, this loss of confidence in the uh, in in the police. And I should mention that we have Blue Ribbon Day on uh, September 28th, and I'd be interested to know what sort of the the sales are like of Blue Ribbons this year compared to last year. Yeah, look, I think Victoria Police over the last few years has somewhat changed from where they used to be. Uh, and I think, look, there's a lot of very good members, and I've always been a very strong supporter of Victoria Police. Uh, 
and the operations what they do and it, it, invariably being a police officer in my opinion is a shit job dealing with people that you deal with every day uh, in a high stressful environment it certainly is not something that i would like to be a member of where i think the issue is is that the level of people that they're pushing through the academy at the moment is quite high it's very very high these people are then being pushed through as quick as they possibly can they're graduating they're going through their course they're being issued their firearm their badge their uniform and I think that they, they need to learn a lot from the older members as well. The older members of the police force know how things fall apart. They know how things deal. They know to monitor before you, you react. Uh, and I think what we've seen is a lot of the younger members who join, there's certainly a group who uh, become quite uh, aggressive. And, they, and and you see that recently with some of the media coverage. And I think that the issue is when Victoria Police loses respect of the community, there's a whole lot of issues of form. And I think it's important that the force command actually then starts to uh, realise that there's an issue and starts to realise what they need to do to improve it. Um, and they need to move quite quick because when things go wrong, they can go very wrong very quick. And we've seen that with uh, the Victoria, Victoria Police, with those, said the one who was uh, bipolar. And, you could, and I've seen the footage where the guy stomped on his head and I think that was outrageous. Uh, and I can completely see why there's an investigation into the Professional Services Command. But well, then it's you now have the at... I, I... I back now, which is the independent broad uh, broad based okay. anti corruption, independent criminal investigation. Yeah, and look, and, and I think that also comments by uh, chief commissioners calling people who uh, have raised concerns about the lockdown are tin foil hats. Yeah, batshit crazy. Batshit crazy. It doesn't. That does nobody any good. Nobody at any good at all. Uh, all that does is then just further disrespects the work that Victoria Police do and the hard members do by a member of the the. I suppose the force command making comments about that. Now they're not people that are uh, complete loony anti-vaxxing people. They're people who are actually concerned that their businesses and their livelihoods are going down the drain. They're people that are concerned that their kids are not receiving the right education. They're people that are concerned they may not be able to pay their bills. They're not people who are anti-vaxxing far left people who are skeptics across everything. And I think that's becoming an issue with Victoria police. You also see that they've taken very, very strong stances with their, uh, their policies now allowing members to wear um, rainbow epaulets on their uniform, signifying that they're members of the uh, LGBTI core. Uh, they're allowing their members to have safe days and safe spaces and that sort of thing. And that's not the core of Victoria Police. The core of Victoria Police is their motto, which is uphold the right. Uh, and that's to make sure that they go out and actually protect the community. Uh, and I think that that's a big issue of a lot of these government departments is now they progress so far to the left uh, in their social policies as well actually forgetting what their main priority is. I and noticed uh, it, it was, uh, there, there was a recent live video which uh, uh, a woman filmed inside Dandenong police station. Uh, she was talking to them about the, the, the mask mandate. And I noticed that there was a rainbow flag in, well, where the uh, reception error is. And to me, it was sort of like, we're in stage we were at stage three lockdown during that time. Uh, this is Dandenong Police Station, and you've got a rainbow flag there. Well, look, the, my, my understanding is that Victoria Police employees are uh, sworn police officers who are the uh, LGBTI liaison officers. Mm. And their job is to basically uh, represent the LGBTI community and to provide, I suppose, if, if people... Uh, identify as LGBTIQ, I believe they have access to them, that staff member. But that's uh, really, I think it's a complete over overreach of what Victoria Police is there to do. Uh, and I've seen the rainbow flag in several police stations. I know it's in Moravian Police Station as well. Um, and I think that's certainly something that needs to be addressed because it's now leaving the proviso of what Victoria Police is. It's creating a socialist utopia, in my opinion, saying that they now sit with the radical left. And, you know, if you are if you identify as um, LGBTI and your feelings are hurt, you can now go to this special police officer and they'll investigate on your behalf. Uh, what should be happening is that every single Victorian should be treated equally under the law. And the law should not be discriminated to any one way or another, regardless of uh, gender, sex, whatever. Um, I think that's where we're starting to see a lot of these issues that are rising from organisations that have been significantly infiltrated by uh, the left, if you will. Now, with this... Uh stage four lockdown uh, continuing, well, scheduled to, to go for at least another uh, six weeks, even though we're getting consistent uh, daily cases now 
under 50. It was 42 today, though you always have to look at how the overall increases, because it increased by 32 today. They say it's because of uh, reclassification, but a lot of the time it's due to false positives or, 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 or duplication. So uh, the curve is getting uh, quite flat, but the Dan's roadmap is basically an elimination strategy. And uh, Victorian Liberal and National Party, they uh, made it very clear from the beginning that they would uh, vote no, and they did vote no to the state of emergency extension. There was an excellent uh, speech against it uh, by former Liberal leader Matthew Guy. I just wish he'd made a speech like that two years ago when it, when it, when it really uh, counted. And obviously, uh, the opposition was vindicated when he got his six-month extension. Uh, he hadn't revealed any of his uh, uh, roadmap uh, at all. And we're, we're, we're finally seeing, well, now uh, some legal challenges to uh, the current lockdown. The, the uh, Mornington Peninsula restaurant owner, uh, Michelle uh, Lero, who well, she's a Liberal Party member, but that doesn't discount the merits of her lawsuit against the curfew, because the thing is, about the curfew, we learned it wasn't the advice of the Chief Health Officer nor Victoria Police. And the state of emergency provisions under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act, you have to follow the Chief Health Officer's directions. And if it's not something that he recommended, then... Uh, ha uh, there's a lot of question about how it can be lawful. Yeah, look, I think it's going to be very interesting to see the legalities of how that plays out. Um, I think that there is going to be some real issues coming forward. And some of these court cases are backed by very strong QCs. Uh, inevitably, I think that that's going to become quite an issue as well, is to see how they play out. And certainly there's a lot of blame going on saying people didn't do things, people did do other things. Uh, and I think it's going to be very, very exciting times to see where this ends up. Uh, we're in the Victorian Upper House today, a motion against the, the curfew uh, passed. Uh, as we know, I don't think that'll influence uh, Dan at all. Uh, there's also another uh, class action by all oh, well-known uh, litigation lawyer, Tony Carbone, on behalf of uh, well, it's a class action led by uh, Jordan Roberts, uh, which is seeking damages for lost income, nervous shock, depression, and anxiety, because that's what a lot of people are feeling uh, for now. So I'll see you next Wednesday for Wilmshrunt, and of course, I'll see you tomorrow night for the Uncuckables. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmshrunt. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.